Applied knowledge is the real power. If you want a lot of money, be a steward. Get knowledge. Do something about it. If you want to accumulate money, you're going to accumulate a bunch of dots on a piece of paper. Money is useful, but only in the right context. It's only paper. It's only a concept. It's only a thing. It's only as valuable as what you do with it. Here's something that I wish I would have understood this at an earlier age, and I still learned it at a very young age. Has anyone read the book, The Millionaire Next Door? I don't like that book. Here's why. Because if you followed exactly what it says, it starts to lead people to believe that accumulated money is power. Accumulation without utilization is merely stored potential and to me is worthless. If all you do is accumulate money the rest of your life by being cheap, everyone in here could be a millionaire if you just don't ever spend money. But also, you know, are you going to enjoy life? Are you going to do the things that you want to do? You know, I don't, I'll share something personal if it's not too personal, but you know, Professor Harrop goes and takes his kids on a great cruise every year or on a great vacation. I mean, some really elaborate ones. What if he said, well, that might really destroy our net worth and I really want to accumulate and get all those big numbers up there. Why? So his kids can wait for him to die? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's utilization that makes the difference. Applied knowledge is the real power. If you want a lot of money, be a steward. Get knowledge. Do something about it. If you want to accumulate money you're going to accumulate a bunch of dots on a piece of paper. Money is useful, but only in the right context. It's only paper. It's only a concept. It's only a thing. It's only as valuable as what you do with it. Quantity of stuff versus quality of life. Consumers just want quantity of stuff. More and more and more. Enough points on... It's like playing a game... You want to get as many points on the scoreboard, but the game never ends. Versus quality of life. This is part of focusing on people as assets, not just things. Interestingly enough, producers probably spend a lot more money than consumers combined. But they still create more value than what they consume. Calculate consequences versus commit to principles. See, sometimes we get deceived if we calculate consequences, like I was talking about earlier. You go to create value, but only conditionally, versus just being a value creator. Just commit to principles. Then see what happens. Just commit to the principles. Just live a principled life. And sometimes that's a high cost, especially in the moment. But it has a big payoff if you're willing to live that way. Always vote for principle, though you may vote alone. And you may cherish the sweetest reflection that your vote is never lost. What I'm saying is, just because something's popular doesn't make it right. Just because everyone's doing something doesn't make it right. You have to understand, is it principled? Just because it's popular doesn't mean you should follow it. There's a, there's a book written like in the 1800s called like Popular Delusions. that talks about tulip mania and all these crazy things that just social agreements, people flock to these ideas that were just ideas and they gave it all this value and credence and there was really nothing there other than someone hyping it up. So last thing is you're really the author of how your life's going to go. There's going to be different roads that come along. There's going to be different obstacles, different bumps, but you're holding the pen in your hand. You're going to have the choice in the next moment. You can do one of two things. You can become a victim or you can be the hero. You choose. The path is yours. Sometimes you have to pave it. Sometimes it's not already laid out for you. But is it worth it? That's the question. So I got, a, I got 15 minutes. If there's any questions, I want to stick around and just answer a few questions. But I just wanted to share with you some of the basic things that I think have helped me to live a workable life, to be happy in my life. And uh, if it's valuable for you, try it on. See how it's useful. But more than anything, remember, producers create more value than they consume. Consumers take more value than they create. If you're going to be self-reliant, if you're going to live a workable life, if you're going to be extraordinary, if you're going to leave a legacy, it's only if you commit to being a producer and living in the abundance paradigm. Questions? Yeah. 
It, well, risk is something that's there, but if it is there, I view it as something to continue to educate myself, to continue to do due diligence, but not something to stop me based upon what others perceive as risk. See, general population and social agreement is that being an entrepreneur would be risky. But to me, I'll even make this statement. There are no even risky investments, only risky investors. It's about people. It's about your own situation. You know, think about a hammer. A hammer in my hands would be useless because I'm not very crafty with a hammer. A hammer in a skilled carpenter's hands could be a very useful tool. And a hammer in a child's hands could be a detrimental tool. It all depends on the person whether that was valuable or not. So to me, when someone else tells me something is risky, from their perspective it is. But based upon my education and what I'm willing to do about it, if I can incorporate my human life value and my characteristics and my abilities into something, that's one of the best ways I can mitigate risk. That's one of the best ways I can reduce risk. But as a producer, all consumers are going to see what producers do is risky. Because as a producer, what I do first is believe. Whether it exists in the marketplace or not, I say, is it possible? And I believe anything is possible. So anything is possible. Then I would say, OK, if it's possible, what could I do to make it probable? What could I do to create favorable circumstances? And a lot of that is I have to start paying for the education. I have to get other experts involved. I have to spend money on it. I don't go into it blindly. And then I continue to say, how can I create the most value in this situation for the most people? And I have a whole system that, of 10 questions. But as I go through the 10 questions, I quantify these questions, 0 to 5. Now, this isn't like a risk analysis where someone would say, hey, I believe high risk equals high return. I think that's a lie. High risk doesn't equal high return. If it were true, we would buy lottery tickets and we'd be wealthy. That's the highest risk I could think of. I would never raise my kid on the philosophy of high risk equals high return. Like, oh, I just won't watch him and he'll figure out more things because that's risky. Now, that, see, if, if a financial thing doesn't make sense or whatever else would be perceived to be risky doesn't make sense in the regular application of life or if I move it to the nth degree, then I would consider it not viable or not aligned with principle. But if something is deemed to be risky because it's just never happened before, like think about it. Someone creating an airplane, that was risky. But look at all that we've done to manage that risk over time, to mitigate it to create contingencies, to bring in expertise. All that took a multitude of people, a lot of research, you know, a lot of human life value, but it became possible. But before flight was ever possible, someone had to imagine it first. So it's usually our imagination that people would consider risky, but it's what we do to implement, implement that imagination and the people that are involved with it that would make it whether it's risky or not risky. So you could have the exact same investment, the same type of idea coming from two different people, and in one it would be completely risky, and in the other it would be very little risk at all. But anyone in the scarcity paradigm is going to pose risk to any investment, for sure, or any situation in life. Because anytime you're going by fear of loss, anytime you believe, you know, there's a dilemma there because you think that doing well is a bad thing, I mean, you could see that there's going to be sabotage in there somewhere, right? So the, the, biggest, the biggest things I invest in right now are my own intellectual property, my own businesses, where I see that being the least risk. I don't invest in a lot of products right now. Will I down the road? Yeah. Did I before? Yeah. But right now, you know, I just, I just, I'm closing a real estate deal right now, and I thought, why would I invest this back into real estate if I can invest it into a book that I, I changed the title of my book. It's called Killing Sacred Cows, which is maybe a little bit of a weird title. But people, see, in, in social agreements and social beliefs, there are sacred cows. People don't want to even talk about it or look at it. It's just tradition. But it's the very thing that holds people back from happiness. So Killing Sacred Cows is about defeating those myths and subtle lies so that people can have prosperity. And so I thought, why not invest all that money in my book? Why not invest it in marketing that? What are the external benefits of that? What would that do to me as a speaker and being able to charge to, to speak? What would that do to my other businesses and getting the message out there that's different than most of what's being perpetuated out there? What would, you know, I start thinking about those returns. And so what I do is I hired, I hired a PR firm. I, I started to brainstorm ideas around it. So I didn't just throw the investment. I created a whole plan to what I was going to do to make that as effective as possible. And then I built as many contingencies in place that I could possibly think of in the moment. But even if, I, even if something happens that I didn't prepare for, I'm passionate about it. So I'm going to stay engaged in it. Where I have investments that 
like I gotta do something about that because I gotta be a steward, but I don't have any passion for it, you know? So it, in my mind, it's transformed a little bit. Wanna master your money? Wanna figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.